Myofascial pain syndrome and trigger points are incredibly common and incredibly difficult to treat. They are a common cause of chronic and persistent pain and contribute greatly to mental and physical disability. The problem is I've found many patients who have trigger points are often underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, and undertreated. So the purpose of this video is to teach you why trigger points matter, what they are, and my current approach to treating them. Let's get started. Hey everyone, Dr. Jeff Pang here. My goal is to help each and every one of you live an active and healthy lifestyle. So if that's something you're interested in, please consider subscribing to my channel. The following is from a talk that I gave to primary care physicians and general practitioner doctors in my community with the hope of increasing awareness of myofascial trigger points and how best to treat them. And even if you're not a physician, if you're someone who is just suffering from trigger points, there are many things to take away from this talk including treatment options that you can try yourself at home. So trigger points are an extremely common cause of musculoskeletal pain, but most physicians, including orthopedists, have a poor understanding and little training in trigger points. So we'll be going over a case today to help you understand why it is so important to know about trigger points. We'll talk about pathophysiology, we'll talk about diagnosis and management, and then we'll discuss trigger point injections. But first, I wanna start with a case. So I wanna go over this case in exquisite detail. And it's gonna seem like it's dragging on and on, but I'm doing this on purpose, mainly because I want you to think about how you would feel as the patient. And I also want you to think about how you would feel as the provider treating this patient. So we have a 16-year-old girl who is an elite level athlete. She reported having left posterior hip pain. You can see on this picture here exactly where she localized her pain. She first saw an orthopedic sports medicine surgeon and got x-rays done, and these were normal. She was diagnosed with hamstring tendonitis, which is a common diagnosis given the location of her pain and she was recommended to go to physical therapy. She did this for three months, but continued to have persistent pain. So she followed up with her orthopedic sports medicine doctor and kept saying, my pain is in the buttocks area. And this was made worse with prolonged sitting as well as long car rides. An MRI of her femur was then requested, and this was also normal. She was advised to rest for two months and then gradually return to her sports. After two months of rest, the pain got somewhat better, but when she started getting back into sports, the pain slowly came back. So she again followed up with Orthosports, who told her to go back to physical therapy. And so she did. She continued physical therapy. She continued to advance her activity back to her sports. But at, but at a routine checkup with her primary care doctor, she told her doctor that she was still in pain, that nothing was helping. She was advised to continue physical therapy and to follow up again with orthosports. And at this time, an MRI of her pelvis was requested. She was told this MRI was also normal, but she continued to localize pain to the buttocks right at the area of the ischial tuberosity. She was again told her diagnosis was proximal hamstring tendonitis. This is despite now two normal MRIs. She was recommended to trial a steroid injection, but the family had concerns about the side effects of steroid injections. So they decided to continue with physical therapy and at a wellness exam with her primary care doctor, she was still in pain. And they recommended uh, and requested uh, a second opinion from a pediatrics sports medicine doctor. So at her ped sports medicine appointment, she reported having bilateral hip pain, now with the left worse than the right, she now takes Advil daily to help control her pain. She still localizes pain directly over the ischial tuberosity and even endorses occasional numbness and tingling in that area. She's still involved extensively in her sports and plays through the pain. Repeat x-rays were done at that appointment, which showed a possible minimally displaced fracture of the inferior pubic ramus. And because of this finding, another MRI was requested. And of course, this MRI was also normal. She was then recommended to try a biomechanical and motion analysis evaluation. This is a highly specialized physical therapy evaluation. And after this, she was told that she probably had proximal hamstring tendinopathy. This is despite now three normal MRIs. 
and again she was recommended even more physical therapy. At this appointment, the patient reported, my goal is to just be able to sit for more than 20 minutes without pain. After a few more weeks of physical therapy, she continued to have persistent pain and now endorsed some low back pain. And because of this, she was recommended to have a lumbar spine MRI to evaluate for referred pain. She was also tried to, she was asked to try meloxicam instead of ibuprofen. Her lumbar spine MRI was essentially normal. She was told to try extracorporeal shockwave therapy in addition to more physical therapy. But unfortunately, after three sessions of shockwave therapy, her symptoms got significantly worse. She was frustrated by her lack of progress and continued to pre-medicate before sports. She was asked to get autoimmune and rheumatologic labs done and to see a pediatric rheumatologist. She was also sent for a third opinion from ortho-hip and to get an MR arthrogram, as well as a diagnostic intraarticular ropivacaine injection to rule out referred pain coming from the hip joint. At her rheumatology appointment, she was told all her labs were normal. She was told her pain is thought unlikely to be of rheumatologic in origin. Her MR arthrogram was also normal. In addition, her diagnostic intraarticular ropivacaine injection did nothing to change her pain. When she made it to her appointment with ortho hip, she was told again, she likely had proximal hamstring tendonitis or ischial apophysitis, but this is despite now five normal MRIs. She was asked to establish care with pain management and to continue physical therapy. When she followed up with rheumatology, she says now she guts through the pain while playing sports. Her pain continues to be worse with prolonged sitting and physical activity. She now has pain that interferes with sleep and rates her pain in eight out of 10 on most days. She continues to pre-medicate before exercise and now even pre-medicates prior to bedtime. She was asked to switch to Celebrex, given how much NSAIDs she is taking, and to establish care with pain management. The pain management doctor told her she probably had issue apophysitis, again, despite normal imaging. She was asked to try low-dose amitriptyline and to see a child pain psychologist. She was also told to try acupuncture, and of course, to continue physical therapy. When she followed up with pain management, she now required a letter for her high school classes to be able to stand up during class time because she couldn't concentrate due to the pain. She was asked to try melatonin for sleep disturbances, and then she was referred to see me. So at this point, the patient has had 16 specialty visits over the span of two years. She's seen ortho sports, pediatric sports, peds rheumatology, pain management, and ortho hip. She's also seen her primary care physician multiple times. She's had, a she has, she's had a total of 23 physical therapy visits and five normal MRI scans. She's had an intraarticular hip injection, which did nothing. She pre-medicates with NSAIDs before exercise and before sleep. And all of this significantly impacts her quality of life. So I wanna stop and ask a question. Does this feel familiar to you? And I bet if you're a primary care doctor, you've cared for a patient like this. So put your primary care hat on right now. What do you do? She's still in pain. She's seen three orthopedic specialists who all told, told her she has something wrong with her hamstring tendon. This is despite five normal MRIs. She's done everything recommended to her to try to treat her pain. Doesn't it feel like something's missing here? With MRIs and advanced imaging, we're really good at treating things we can test for or things we, that we can see on imaging, but we still tell patients that they have a problem, even though multiple imaging studies have said nothing is wrong. But what if it's something that we can't test for? And what if it's something that we can't see on an MRI? Are we missing anything on our differential? And the answer, of course, is yeah. So when I first saw this patient, this is what I found on exam. She had focal tenderness to palpation at the ischial tuberosity. She had exquisite tenderness to palpation within both gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, gluteus minimus, and the piriformis muscles. And very interestingly, this muscle tenderness was not documented in any of the other orthopedic providers' notes, despite the patient reporting the same pain to every provider. I did a diagnostic ultrasound evaluation for the sake of thoroughness and found that, yeah, her 
proximal hamstring tendons appeared normal. There was no signs of tendinopathy, no signs of tendonitis. And so our differential includes proximal hamstring tendinopathy, ischial apophysitis, referred pain coming from the spine, referred pain coming from the hip, and what else? So let me read you an excerpt from the Trigger Point Manual by Travell and Simons, widely considered the Bible for all things myofascial trigger points. Myofascial trigger points are mistakenly diagnosed as other conditions. Here's what they write. Those clinicians who have become skilled at diagnosing and effectively managing myofascial trigger points frequently evaluate patients who were referred to them as a last resort by fellow practitioners. These patients commonly arrive with a long list of diagnostic procedures and diagnoses, none of which satisfactorily explain the cause of or relieved the patient's pain. This frustrating situation is understandable because few medical schools or physical therapy schools teach myofascial trigger points as a regular part of their curriculum so that most physicians and physical therapists now in practice have received at most a hit or miss exposure to myofascial trigger points. Since myofascial trigger point pain is so common and because patients are most likely to experience the pain at sites other than the trigger point location, the clinician is at risk of missing the diagnosis unless he or she considers the possibility of and specifically searches for the responsible displaced trigger point culprits. These are the areas where the patient had exquisite tenderness to palpation on exam. So what you see here, the X marks common areas where myofascial trigger points can form in the muscle. These are the exact areas where the patient had pain. The red areas are where people can experience referred pain from these trigger points. Notice that the red can be pretty far away from where the actual trigger points are. Notice also that there is considerable overlap of red to the area where the patient reported her pain at the area of the ischial tuberosity. So I suspected our patient had myofascial trigger points in all of her gluteal muscles referring pain to the area of the ischial tuberosity. So what is her likely diagnosis? She probably has myofascial trigger points in all three of her gluteal muscles. Trigger points are not seen on MRI. They are not seen on ultrasound. It is a clinical diagnosis only found through careful physical exam and thorough palpation. So I talked with the family about proceeding with trigger point injection therapy and they wanted to try it. So we did a total of three sessions of trigger point injections, each spaced one week apart. We got a significant amount of muscle local twitch responses during each session. And the patient noted significant interval improvement in her pain after every session. This was her follow-up with me after three rounds of trigger point needling. She was completely off all medications, including NSAIDs. She had significantly decreased pain with exercise, significantly decreased pain with sitting. She had no more pain with sleep. She was no longer seeing child pain psychology, and she no longer needed to see pain management. Bottom line, after seeing a total of five orthopedic specialists, this patient was finally pain-free after two and a half years. But the question remains, why did it take so long for the diagnosis to be made? And one of the reasons we discussed already is because myofascial trigger points are mistakenly diagnosed as other conditions. Case in point, this patient was told by every orthopedist she saw that she had proximal hamstring tendonitis because that's where she had her pain. This is despite multiple negative imaging modalities. The other arguably more important reason is because myofascial trigger points are not taught in medical schools. They're not taught in residency and they're not even taught in fellowship. They aren't even in most orthopedic textbooks. And if they aren't in textbooks, and they aren't in any curriculum, then they never make it into the differential diagnosis, which is exactly what happened with our patient. And so my goal today is to, it's to not make you all experts in myofascial trigger points, but at least to help you understand that trigger points are an extremely common cause of pain and that they must be included on the differential diagnosis for any type of chronic pain that is not responding to traditional treatment. And we're gonna first start with, what are trigger points? So the definition offered by Travell and Simons from the trigger point manual, a trigger point is a hyper irritable spot in a taut band of a skeletal muscle that is painful on 
compression, stretch, overload, or contraction of the tissue. It can cause referred pain that is perceived distant from the spot. And so for anyone who's ever gotten a massage before or seen a physical therapist and told your muscles are really tight or are all knotted up, they are referring to the fact that you have a bunch of trigger points in your muscle. So what causes trigger points? Well, trauma or injury can definitely do it. We see this all the time after whiplash injuries and motor vehicle accidents. People tend to get persistent neck pain due to trigger points in their upper trapezius and their levator scapula. But most people who have trigger point pain actually have no history of injury and no history of trauma. And that's because when you look at the most common causes of trigger points, many of them are caused by repetitive use or chronic overloading conditions. And these include poor posture, repetitive movements, chronic tension, and a sedentary lifestyle. And the reason for this is because one possible mechanism for the formation of trigger points is due to the energy crisis hypothesis. So the theory goes, when you have low level muscle contractions due to repetitive use, this results in a decrease in intramuscular perfusion and repetitive low level contraction results in local ischemia, hypoxia, and insufficient ATP synthesis. This leads to increasing acidity and calcium accumulation, and that results in subsequent sarcomere contracture. And it's this sustained sarcomere contracture due to loss of ATP that contributes to intramuscular ischemia and tissue hypoxia, with the end result being a vicious cycle of myofascial trigger point pain. So to put that in more simple terms, when you have a trigger point, it clamps down on surrounding blood vessels. This results in decreased blood flow, decreased perfusion, which results in an imbalance of nutrients, specifically ATP. And we all know what rigor mortis is, right? When you don't have enough ATP, your actin cannot decouple from myosin, and therefore you have a tight muscle. So the imbalance in ATP results in progressive muscle tightening, which causes even more restriction in blood flow, which results in even less ATP, which results in more muscle tightening. And round and round we go through this trigger point pain cycle. So what do people feel? Patients can describe all sorts of symptoms related to trigger points. They can be a deep ache or a burning sensation. Trigger points can often restrict range of motion and cause stiffness or weakness. By far the strangest thing trigger points can do is that they can cause some people to feel numbness or tingling or have radiating symptoms. This is what throws many providers off. These symptoms often prompt MRI scans of the spine or an EMG nerve conduction study that come back normal. For example, trigger points in the infraspinatus muscle often can cause shooting sensations down into the fingers. You can see here that with the distribution of the red, so this typically would prompt a cervical spine evaluation, and certainly that does need to be done, but treatment of the infraspinatus trigger points results in complete resolution of the radiating symptoms. Here are some other common examples. It's well known that untreated trapezius trigger points are a common cause of tension headaches and radiating pain into the neck and the temple. Similarly, many people with, uh, diagnosed with tennis elbow also have shooting pains into the wrist and fingers. And this is due to concurrent trigger points in their extensor muscles. And this can be mistaken for nerve entrapment problems such as radial tunnel syndrome. So how do we diagnose trigger points? Well, it's really difficult because there's actually no consensus on diagnostic criteria. This is from a review article written by physicians at the NIH. Trigger points are often an overlooked component of musculoskeletal pain because its pathophysiology is not fully understood. Besides the use of palpation, there are currently no accepted criteria for identifying or quantitatively describing myofascial trigger points, and this includes biomarkers, electrodiagnostic testing, imaging. In addition, diagnostic criteria are imprecise, and the full impact of myofascial pain syndrome on life activity and function is not fully understood. So it seems currently the best way to diagnose trigger points is to first recognize that they are always part of the differential diagnosis in anyone who has pain. And then only through careful palpation of affected muscle groups. Okay, so once you identify that someone has myofascial trigger points, how do we treat them? So how I kind of frame this discussion with my, my patients is to get them to hit as many points in the trigger point pain cycle as possible. So what does heat do? 
Heat helps improve blood flow. That's why people with chronic muscular pain like going to saunas and hot tubs. Stretching and strengthening exercises help with the muscle tightness. Manual therapy, which our physical therapy colleagues spend a lot of time on, also helps with muscle tightness. TENS units help increase blood flow and can help address muscle chemistry imbalance. NSAIDs or medications can also help with this chemistry imbalance. And for the majority of people, their symptoms will slowly improve as they use a combination of all of these treatment modalities to break up and loosen the underlying myofascial trigger points. It's the people that continue to have persistent and chronic pain that we move on to the next step, which is trigger point injection therapy. So the theory behind a trigger point injection is if we can stick a really small needle into the trigger point to physically break it up, then that would be a much more direct way of treating trigger points. Now, I want to point out one thing here, and it's that technique really matters. The way I used to do my trigger point injections is how most physicians currently do it. They palpate, they go in, inject, out, and then done. They don't fan around. They don't get or look for muscle twitches. They don't, they don't search for all the trigger points. And the reason that matters is because we just learned that where people feel their pain is not necessarily where they have the problem. Trigger points often cause referred pain. So understanding and knowing the referral pain pattern becomes extremely important. And then there's the question of a local twitch response. What expert consensus concludes is that if you don't specifically look for and get a local twitch response, you're probably not going to get a good outcome and your patient is not going to notice long-term relief. This is from that same review article by the physicians from the NIH. There is considerable agreement that elicitation of a local twitch response produces more immediate and long-lasting pain relief than no elicitation of local twitch response. Within minutes of a single induced local twitch response, Shaw et al. found that the initially elevated levels of pro-inflammatory neuropeptides within the active myofascial trigger point in the upper trapezius muscle decreased to levels approaching that of normal, uninvolved, tissue. So the next question is, what is a local twitch response? And rather than describing it, let me show you what it looks like. So what you see here is a trigger point injection session of the vastus lateralis. When we hit a trigger point head on, the patient's entire outer quad contracts. That's the twitch response. That's an involuntary muscle contraction, and the more of those we get, the better. We aren't just going in, injecting, then done. We are taking our time, needling the entirety of the region where the patient has a collection of trigger points. This is a needling session of the gastrocnemius and the soleus. The twitch responses in the calf are much more subtle because it's a smaller muscle group. But when we hit it right on, Right on the spot, you can see an involuntary muscle contraction that causes this patient's entire foot to move. Notice again that we're taking our time. We're fanning all around, searching for all those muscle twitches. So what's the data behind trigger point injections? Do they actually work? This was a systematic review and meta-analysis looking at 20 randomized control trials examining the effectiveness of trigger point needling therapy specifically for the neck and the shoulders. And they found that dry needling can be recommended for relieving myofascial trigger point pain in neck and shoulders in the short and medium term, but wet needling, so wet needling means using some type of anesthetic, lidocaine or ripivacaine, is found to be more effective than dry needling in relieving myofascial trigger point pain in neck and shoulders in the medium term, with the medium term they define as one month of follow-up. This was another systematic review looking at 19 studies to see if trigger point needling is an effective treatment option in the head, trunk, upper extremities, and lower extremities. And they found that ma the majority of high quality studies included in this review show measured benefit from trigger point dry needling for myofascial trigger points in multiple body areas. They say trigger point needling is more effective than stretching, percutaneous electric nerve stimulation, so a TENS unit, and at least as effective as manual therapy. And in this study, follow-up periods range from one month to six months. So it seems like there's pretty good evidence for the use of trigger point injections, but my question is, 
How come the results are not even better? How come we aren't seeing dramatic results with complete resolution of pain, like in the case I presented earlier? And I think it's because this has everything to do with technique. So let me give you some more examples. This is a 30-year-old male. He had six years of hip pain. He had multiple MRIs. He even had an arthroscopic hip surgery that didn't do anything to change his pain. His symptoms improved dramatically after five sessions of trigger point needling to the gluteal muscles. 24-year-old female with four years of knee pain. She had multiple MRIs. She had two years of physical therapy. Her symptoms improved significantly after two sessions of trigger point needling to the vastus lateralis. 56-year-old female, two years of bilateral Achilles tendon pain. She was actually recommended to have Achilles tendon surgery by both a podiatrist and an orthopedic surgeon specializing in the foot and ankle. She was able to get back to ballet after three sessions of trigger point needling to the calf, not the Achilles tendon. This is a great example of trigger points causing referred pain. This is a 61-year-old male with one and a half years of posterior thigh pain that prevented him from exercising. He was back to biking pain-free after three sessions of trigger point needling to his hamstrings. 56-year-old female, unable to work over one year due to bilateral tennis elbow. She had multiple cortisone injections with minimal relief. She was pain-free back to work after three sessions of needling her forearm muscles. 57-year-old female, three years of right lateral ankle pain. She had multiple MRIs and cortisone shots. She was finally symptom-free after three sessions of trigger point needling to the peroneal muscles. 30-year-old male, four years of worsening neck pain. He had dramatic relief of symptoms after two sessions of needling to his trapezius and levator scapula. He was able to return to serving his community as a first responder. Now, I actually have a fairly large collection of patients just like this, and of course, I understand that all of these cases are anecdotal, but what's really interesting is that you can see here that trigger point needling and injections are an active area of research with more and more clinical trials being published every year, especially in the last few years. And it's even become a hot topic in the last two years at the American Medical Society for Sports Medicine Conference. Other physicians who have gone down the myofascial trigger point rabbit hole have also amassed a large collection of cases where trigger point needling has dramatically reduced patient symptoms when nothing else has worked. Now we definitely don't have everything figured out. And my hope is that with all of these new clinical trials, we will start to reveal what I found in my own clinical practice, which is that a large majority of people with chronic pain have underlying myofascial trigger points that are underdiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or undertreated. And as more providers start to learn about trigger points, then patients who are suffering from chronic pain can finally get the diagnosis and the treatment that they very desperately need. So where can you start to learn more? This is one of the best free resources to start learning about trigger points. So you just go to the website, triggerpoints.net. So let's say I have someone with anterior knee pain that's not getting better with physical therapy. And I wanna check for myofascial trigger points, but I don't know where to check. So you first go to the website, you will be presented with the option to select a symptom area. So we'll click on the knee. Then in number two, you can select medial lateral anterior knee. So we would click on the anterior knee. And then in number three, the website will show me all the muscles that can have trigger points that refer pain to the anterior knee. And then you would check the patient and palpate those specific areas to look for the underlying myofascial trigger points. And I'll tell you from experience, anterior knee pain is almost always the VMO or the rectus femoris. And once you treat those trigger points with needling, the patient's pain goes away. The other resource that I use are these pain charts. I actually created these charts and put them up in each one of my exam rooms. The beauty behind this is that I can ask the patient to look at the chart and point to where they feel pain. Then I can do a careful palpation of the affected muscles to find if they have trigger points there. What's actually more common is that while the patient is waiting, they study these charts on their own. And when I walk into the room, they say, doc, my pain is right here. And they point on the chart exactly where they have a trigger point, and almost always the symptoms match perfectly. So to summarize, I really encourage all of you to start thinking about myofascial trigger points as a cause of pain and including it on your differential. This will be especially important in those patients who have had unexplained or persistent pain 
that is not responding to conventional treatment. And if you're interested in learning more about trigger points and trigger point injections, check out this video next. Thanks for watching.